Hi, this is Christoph Limpelaire, and this is episode number 9 of the Redis and Laravel series. Now in this episode, similarly to the previous episode, we're not really going to look at anything to do with Laravel. In this episode specifically, we're going to look at Redis's internal configuration that I believe you should know about when using Redis on a production server. This will give you a better understanding of how Redis works and what to expect from it, especially under heavy loads. So let's get started. Let's use Vim and open up the Redis configuration. Now, I'm not going to look at every single configuration in this file. Um, I'm going to start off with the save configuration. And this is under the snapshotting section. And the important part about this is, as I've said in previous episode, episodes, Redis is persistent to disk by default. What that means is, Periodically, Redis will actually take a snapshot of everything that's in your memory right now and save it to disk. Now, these settings, the save settings here, determine how often this happens. So as you can see, the save option takes seconds and number of changes as parameters. What this means is that in order for Redis to back up your information, the seconds and number of changes must have occurred. So for example, with the first example here, save 901, I believe that's uh, that's 15 minutes. So after 15 minutes, if we have at least one write in, in Redis memory, then we're going to go ahead and, and take a snapshot. Now if uh, with the other one, instead, it's only 300 seconds if we have 10 writes, and again, 60 seconds if we have 10,000 writes. So if, if you'd rather change how often it does, does this maybe you want it to be more often maybe you want it to be less often you don't care as much about losing data then you can modify these settings here uh, but these are i believe important to know um, because that way you know exactly how much information you'll lose if there's a power outage or something like that now if we go down let's see uh, this setting right here just basically says that if for some reason Redis was not able to do an RDB snapshot, which is saving it to, to disk, then don't accept any more write operations. Basically fail the hard way. Now this is by default set to yes, because uh, the people that created Redis want you to know that there's a problem. And that's probably a good thing. If you have users using Redis, or I'm sorry, your application that is implementing Redis, and you can't write anything in memory, then that, sh that should probably just stop working in a very bad way. That should just crash it, and that way you know there's a problem instead of going maybe days, maybe weeks, without even knowing that things aren't getting saved. So that's probably a good thing. Uh, there are some more options here. Let's scroll down. Oh, yes, right here. Uh, the DB file name, redis.rdb. Now this is going to be the the file name for when your um, your dump snapshot snapshot gets saved, and that's the name of it. And then this is the directory that it's saved in. This is important to know because, frankly, if you're using this in production, you should be making backups. You should be taking this redis.rdb, which is stored in this directory, and backing it up somewhere else. I recommend something like S3, Amazon's S3, where that way you know that it's you you're, you don't risk losing it. You have it on the cloud. Um, Amazon Web Services is hosting it. You could even have it locally on your computer or on another cloud somewhere else. Spread it out everywhere. That way, if, if a data center goes out, then you're still safe. You're still not going to lose your information. But this is pretty important, so be sure to keep that in mind. Now, this next block here is about replication. This is really interesting stuff, especially if you want to scale your application because you have a lot of uh, users and you need a lot of, of data stored in Redis and that sort of thing, you should definitely check out replication. This is a pretty loaded topic, so I'm not going to cover it right now, but be aware that this is here. And I'm going to keep scrolling down, make sure I don't forget anything. Uh, this is still about replication. Security is interesting if you have a shared environment, maybe you have shared hosting or something like that, and you have multiple websites hosted on this one server and you don't want people to be able to use uh, commands or whatever you can set a password and you can also oh this is interesting here uh, maybe not really useful uh, in most cases at least probably not for me but you can rename commands so for example get set 
L push, all those are commands. You can rename them, and as you see here in the in the documentation, you give it a completely random string with numbers. That way, only your application can know that the command name is is like that. Um, so if you don't want somebody else using your command, they don't have any way of guessing it. So that's a, a pretty good command, fun little command there. All right, now this one is limits, and the first option in limits is the max number of clients that you can accept. This by default is set as the current file limit on um, on Linux, minus 32 apparently because Redis reserves a few file descriptors for internal uses. Uh, obviously, as you can see, this is really well documented. So I'm just kind of running through these, but I recommend that you take some time and actually read through the documentation. They did a really good job in this config file. It's pretty awesome. Uh, we're not gonna change this. This is a pretty good number. And then, uh, this right here though I do want to talk about. This is the max memory that you're going to allocate to Redis. Because of the way Redis manages memory, it's usually a good idea to set this property. Redis is coded in C and uses memory allocation implementation that won't always free up memory uh, to the OS as soon as the key is removed. Uh, but really without going into too much detail, you should be aware that the max memory should be based on your expected peak usage, peak memory usage. So for example, if you if you have a Redis workload that only uses one gigabyte or one gigabyte most of the time, but you've seen it peak to two gigabytes under really heavy load, maybe once or twice, you need to provision that for two gigs. If you don't set a max limit, Redis could continue to store more and more data without evicting other data you don't need anymore ramping up your memory usage and possibly taking down your machine because of lack of memory. You definitely don't want that. So you want to set a max memory policy. Now that might sound scary at first, but be aware that there are options to also enable when you set max memory policy. And this is what I just scrolled to right here. This is the max memory policy itself. And uh, there are six different options. The first option is called no eviction. Well, actually, let me back up really quickly before I, I, I talk about this. And let me say that max memory by itself to set a hard cap is not the only case that you'd want to use it for. You could also use it, for example, if you come from a mem memcached background and you're using memcached to store things in memory, but there's no persistence and you want to do a similar thing to Redis, then you could use something like max memory policy. You could set a max memory amount lower than you anticipate it to be used for, but then you can set one of these max memory policies to get rid of old keys you don't need anymore. So it's constantly deleting old keys and uh, not using a lot of memory at all. So you might have an application that could use something like this. I haven't really used this before, but I could see it being pretty useful in, in some situations. Uh, I just haven't had a need for it yet. All right, so let me go back to the max memory policies now. I'm actually going to talk about those six different ones. The first one is no eviction. This just returns an error when the memory limit is reached and the client tries to execute more commands that use memory, um, which is usually writes, but there are a few other ones, I think, like delete, I think, uses some memory. So this may be a good one to use if your application really relies on Redis a lot to properly function. So it might stop your app from functioning when you have this, but at least you won't have unexpected behavior that could cause more trouble to you or to your users. So that's option number one. Option number two is volatile LRU. LRU stands for least recently used, and this option removes only keys with an expiration date or expiration time that's been least recently used. Then another option is all keys LRU. This removes any key least recently used, if possible. Then volatile random removes only keys with an expiration, but it does so randomly. It just picks three by default. It picks three and it, it picks one of them to remove. Then you have all keys random. This removes any key, not just one with expiration, and it does this randomly again. And then finally, we have volatile TTL, which removes only keys with an expiration and it removes the ones that are closest to expiration to expiring. Which one you use totally depends on your application and what you're willing to deal with. 
what's probably more important is actually understanding and knowing what behavior to expect in case you do run in this situation. I think I think that's one of the most important things when thinking about scale like this. Let's move on to the next option. And oh yeah, as I said, by default, it chooses a sample of three. You can change this here. Keep in mind that this number was chosen because it doesn't use a lot of memory or computing power. So the default is three. Next section is called append only mode. Now by default, Redis synchronously dumps your data set to disk. So this means that you may lose a few minutes of writes depending on your configured save points, which we looked at earlier, you know, depending on the time and number of writes. An alternative to that asynchronous dumping though is using AOF persistence. Now AOF logs every write operation and is played again at server startup. So this is guaranteed to be more complete than RDB, which is the default one. Uh, because it, it, if you use something like RDB, you might lose a few minutes data waiting for, you know, the OS has, hadn't written everything to disk yet. Even though it was cute to do so, it hadn't done it yet. Whereas with AOF, you don't have that problem. So you're guaranteed uh, to be more complete. Now the disadvantages of using AOF is that AOF files are going to be bigger than RDB files for the exact same data set and it could also be slower so really which one should you use being that the append only is set to no by default honestly i think you should use both i think this should be turned on to yes for most applications um, now it really depends on how much information you're comfortable with losing the performance is not going to change much at all and you risk losing a lot less data um, so when you when you do turn this on to yes if you do end up doing that then be sure to scroll down to this section here, which talks about F-Sync. And the default F-Sync option is going to be every second. I, I do recommend leaving it to that. I would leave it personally to that. But you can also set it to no or to always. If you really don't want to lose any data at all, then you can use the always one. But be aware that switching it to always is definitely the slowest option. This is basically all the options and configurations I'm gonna walk you through. There are a few more for AOF F-Sync. These are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I'd probably leave them to, to what they are by default. Just guys, remember to do backups. You don't wanna have some kind of instance disappearing in the cloud, uh, some kind of disk failure or whatever could happen and you lose all your, your information, even if it's not really, really important information that's just not something you want to go through. So be sure to back up your information and, and keep looking at this documentation on these uh, these config options here. You have LUA scripting, which is interesting and I haven't covered yet. You might want to check that out. And then of course there's Redis clustering, which is another scaling option, which is very interesting, uh, but I'm just not going to cover it in this episode here. And then this talks about slow logs. So if you have a query that takes longer than expected, um, you can set what you think is slower than expected and when to log it and that sort of thing and you have event notifications with publish and subscribe um, and more advanced con configurations so keep scrolling through this check it out but thanks again for watching I th I'm pretty sure I'm gonna do one more episode I want to finish on episode number 10 and then that's gonna wrap up the, the Redis series and Laravel series the reason I'm doing that is because I really want to get into AWS a little bit more. I've got a lot of requests for that. A lot of people want to get started with AWS or they've already gotten started, but there's so much in AWS and AWS is Amazon Web Services, by the way, just in case you didn't know. And so I want to walk through a lot of the different very advanced tools that we have access to today. And frankly, most of them are really cheap as well. So if you're not using some of them for your applications, I definitely want you to be aware of them and I want you to see what you're missing out. Um, I mean, of course, probably you might be using some other tools from different companies. AWS is not the only one, but they do have a lot of very advanced s tools at your disposition. So um, thanks again for watching this episode. Tune in for the next one, episode number 10, which will be next week. And check out my Twitter at ScalarCode and then the website at ScalarCode.com or just ScalarCode.com, mixing the two of them. Uh, thanks, thank you guys so much for your support. Have a wonderful day. See you later.